Kartik Rangarajan from uh, Adipar on access control with concierge. Before we start, another reminder to thank our sponsors, Fitbit and HackerOne. Thank you to Fitbit and HackerOne and all the other sponsors whose names show up on your badge. So without further ado, Kartik Rangarajan. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Hopefully, you're having a good Monday afternoon. I'm here to talk about concierge and how we do access control with it. To introduce myself, uh, I am Karthik Rangarajan. I am the lead security engineer at Adipar. Uh, I'm a huge proponent of the InfraOps framework. We've spoken about it before, where we are running DevOps, security, and IT ops as a single unit with security at the forefront. I have hosted podcasts in the past. Uh, I used to be a daily host of the InfoSec Daily podcast. I have hosted uh, this thing called the InfoSec Hot Button, which had an early death, unfortunately. Um, but most importantly, I am a dreamer and an idealist. I think about grand solutions. Sometimes I succeed at building them, sometimes I don't. But today, we're going to talk about concierge and my IAM dream and how we're trying to live the IAM dream. Uh, we're going to talk about the motivations for building concierge, the different design considerations that went into it, as well as some of the implementation details of how we did things and why we did them that way, as well as a recorded demo, because live demos always go amazingly well. Cool. So, about in the beginning of age, 100,000 years ago, we had 101 credentials. We had Users log in via Open LDAP, single sign-on with Google, Salesforce, Expensify, SSH, GitHub, Slack, our own SaaS product that we have for customers. Users would log into that as well. And it was a nightmare to manage them. We had so many credentials. We didn't really have a single source of truth. We didn't know where users were, what they were doing, things like that, which obviously meant if you were a new employee, you had to spend the next two days onboarding yourself. There wasn't an easy way to figure out what you had to get access to. You would have to file a JIRA ticket, and somebody would have to respond to the JIRA ticket, approve it. Somebody in IT ops creates you in like five different things. Somebody in DevOps creates you in four more things. Somebody in business operations in three more things, and so on and so forth. And there wasn't like a single place where you could go to and say, hey, I need access to these 10 things to do my job effectively, and please give me access to these things. So, which essentially meant people were really confused. IT was really confused. I was really confused about where people were getting access to what, and it was just tedious. Offboarding wasn't fun either. We had as I said, 101 credentials. And when you have to offboard somebody from all of it within 30 minutes on the day they leave, it's not the most fun time. We had Google Forms that tracked all the services that we had and created three different Jira tickets for different IT people and DevOps people and sales people and finance people to delete users from all these things. It was painful. It was really painful. Auditing wasn't fun either. The auditors would come and they would be like, hey, show me all the things you've done with your users and make sure that you've followed your control processes and I would spend the next three days pulling up these logs. It was a lot of fun. It was the best part of my life. Um, obviously, we didn't need a solution for this at all. But the biggest part of it all was that there was no single source of truth. We didn't know what users should have access to. We would. We didn't know who their managers were. We didn't know what department they belonged to. We would see them in Open LDAP, and we would be like, oh, right, that's their name. Let's go search them in our HR directory. Oh, shit, their managers aren't the same anymore. Let's make sure we change them. Oh, their role has changed? Well, let's retroactively remove access to things and stuff like that, which isn't ideal. That's not how you should be running access management. You shouldn't be catching up. You should be proactive. You should know exactly what's happening with everything else. So I went down this path. I was like, is single sign-on the way to do all this? Maybe we should just have one login or Okta or ping identity or any of, any of the thousand solutions in that space. Just, just throw money at it and solve it for us. And it seemed an appealing option. All of these did solve a whole bunch of problems for us. It let us manage users according to certain roles. It let us manage a whole bunch of apps. You could centralize stuff like Google and Salesforce and stuff like that without having to worry. They provided sort of the same security controls. Uh, 
you know, they would provide sync two factor, they would let us IP whitelist and stuff like that. But the biggest downside was that we would have to manage Active Directory. This is a true story. Consuela is the DevOps mascot. She's our dog that's always watching over everything. The moment I mentioned AD in the meeting that we all had, she threw up immediately. As soon as I said we had to set up Active Directory, Consuela threw up in the corner of the room. And I could have taken it as a sign that I was on the wrong path, but I did not. I was like, Consuela is just sick. It's okay. She's, she's just scared of things. So we, we went forward with AD. But before we set up AD, before we did all of that, we had to think about a system to actually manage these different moving parts. And there are a lot of moving parts when you set up something like this. So that's where Concierge came in. Concierge's main goal was to sync users automatically with the source of truth. And whatever that source of truth was, manage 80 users in groups so that you don't have to actually go to a Windows machine to do it. Manage access to applications depending on a user's role or a department or whatever else it might be. Centralize SSH access and other types of temporary access that users might have. Provide a centralized location for user access audit so that I don't spend three wonderful days going through logs of various different things. Most important of all, never ever RDP into a Windows server. That was actually the biggest goal for Concierge. I don't want to RDP to things. So I was like, I'm just going to build something that prevents me from RDPing into things. There were a few design considerations that went into building something like Concierge. Mostly it has to be extensible. If I'm building the solution, if we're doing this right, then anybody should be able to go in and change it to morph to their environment. I didn't want to build something specific for Adapar. I wanted to build something that anybody in the world with the same kind of problems could use. It had to be modular. What if you didn't use some of the same HR systems? What if you did not want to use one login? What if you don't use salt or any of the same things that we use? Well, it still has to work for you. It shouldn't just break because you don't use some of the same things that we do. It should provide a RESTful API. I mean, great, we have a web app that we can manage users in, but if it can't integrate into anything else, that's completely useless. We have to have it integrate into other systems that we have in place, and it has to perform the same way across all the different uses we have for it. Most importantly, I didn't want to reinvent the wheel. A lot of the, prob a lot of the problems in the space have been solved by somebody else. And I wanted to look at what problems have already been solved and just do the things that other people haven't done or I'm not confident in the solutions that somebody else can provide. So. The biggest thing we started with was a single source of truth. Who works for you? At Adapar, we use Bamboo HR for our HR management system. It was our HR directory, and it is updated by our HR folks, and they manage all of it. However, using this, there were some kinks. If our IT systems depended on it, we had to make sure we told HR that there were now more dependencies on the system that they use for finance and other HR audit purposes. So if they change somebody's department, if they change what a department is called, if they change somebody's name, stuff like that, we had to know, we had to account for that, and we had to make sure they knew there was an interdependency. We couldn't work in a vacuum. We also had to have a single source of truth for who can access our systems. We had to track who had access to what and what groups they were in and stuff like that. And that's where Active Directory came in, how much ever it made me miserable. Um, Active Directory tracked all of our users, all of our AD groups. It made sure we knew who had access to what. The other thing is how do they log into systems? There are a few systems that integrate with AD. But there's a lot of systems that don't. We had Google Apps, we had Salesforce, we had a whole bunch of things, and that's where we have one login come in to do some of the single sign-on and SAML authentication for us. So single, one login provided single sign-on for Google, Salesforce, Expensify, Bamboo, which are a whole bunch of other things that we use. And for a lot of other things, we just use Google's OAuth single sign-on. So one login kind of became our centralized place to manage users and systems and things like that. So what does it all look like? What does concierge architecture actually look like? So we have Bamboo HR, which is our source of truth for who works for us. We have Active Directory, which is our source of truth for who has access to what. We have one login, which lets people access things. 
So what concierge does is it pulls employee details from Bamboo HR and it gets who they work for, what their department is, what their first and last name is, what their email should be, things like that. It pushes that active directory. Based on what department they're in, it adds them to certain groups. It creates, it allows our IT ops people to create new users and manage them within groups. If somebody's role changes, if somebody needs access to something that we automatically don't grant them access to, then it lets them manage groups and stuff like that within AD so that you don't have to actually manage AD. One login then just syncs with AD. It, there's a connector that pulls information from AD. There are roles and mappings and whatnot within one login that tells one login who has access to what, and they automatically get access to those things on day one without IT having to go in and manually do things. But one of the things we ran into was we use Linux servers. People SSH into it based on their public keys. We don't use AD for this. How are we going to manage this centrally? And we use EC2 instances, but ideally it should work no matter what cloud platform or local platform that we use. That's where concierge helps. So we already have the system. We have EC2 instances or OpenStack or Rackspace or whatever else you have. We use SaltStack with an Adapara. Salt is our um, configuration management system. We use Salt and Pepper along with Vault in some cases to manage all of our configuration management secrets, setup systems, things like that. So what we did was we wrote a Salt module, a Salt state, uh, to actually manage users within concierge. So Salt actually pulls, um, Salt retrieves memberships, usernames, public keys, stuff like that from concierge. The way Salt gets public keys is it's part of our standard user onboarding to have users that need SSH access to upload public keys into concierge. And Salt retrieves all of these different information um, and manages them within all of the EC2 instances that it is supposed to manage. So it creates, deletes, or updates users based on the server role. So say we have a server that is for our data team to use. If somebody is within the AD group for data, it adds all of them as well as their SSH keys. Say somebody leaves, somebody gets off-boarded, whatever, then if they're removed from the data group, it automatically removes them from all of these instances. We don't have to, have to go in and manage this within salt separately. We don't have to say, oh, let's make a pull request to remove their public key from salt. It is all automatic and it runs every 30 minutes or something like that. One of the biggest things we have to deal with as a fintech company is that we have to limit who has access to what. We can't give everyone access to production. We can't give everyone access to staging or you know, stuff like that. We have very sensitive data. Our customers care about who has access to that data. So we need to have ephemeral SSH access. So ephemeral access to a lot of things, not just SSH, which means that we had to build something within concierge. And we call this access services within concierge. You want access to AC2 instances? OK, concierge will do that for you. You want access to AWS itself? Sure, we can set that up within concierge. You want access to individual customer instances within Adapar to do support or help them on board or whatever it might be, we will manage that within concierge. We even built something called Comet, which is automated environments that last for a period of two days that developers can run code on, do performance testing on, stuff like that. And all of that is managed within concierge. The way we did that is by using Python meta classes to sort of make this all kind of extensible and modular. So there is something called the dormant service interface, which any service has to extend and implement a whole bunch of methods. So each service will have to define how to create a user, delete a user, list all users within each access object, which is, you know, if you have SSH, it would be a.adapar.com, b.adapar.com, stuff like that. So list users within each access object list the different access objects that people can get access to. It also defines the approval process. If you request access to a server or if you request access to an instance, do you need manager approval? Do you need secondary approval from somebody in DevOps? Stuff like that. 
each of the services will have to implement that. The whole goal of it was that if somebody is adding a new service, they don't have to think about how the backend works. They don't have to think about how the UI works. They should be able to extend the interface and it should just be magic. It should just work without them having to think about maintaining users, without them having to think about uh, deleting them once their access time expires, stuff like that. The, one of the way we manage that is with Celery. So Celery is an async job runner which can run on either a RabbitMQ backend or a Redis backend. So we use Celery to kind of do a lot of the background tasks for us. So listing access objects, expiring user access whenever their time expires, creating new users. We don't want a user to sit and wait when their access gets approved. So creating users backend in the backend without having the API wait for it. Stuff like that is managed with Celery. So let's see how it works. Uh, I have a demo for you guys. Um, if I can get out of this thing, uh, which I'm failing to. How do I stop? Oh, there, that worked. Okay. Uh, my computer is not behaving like I expected to. Cool. So this is concierge. We built sign in with Google, so we use OAuth with Google to log in. Um, the basic functionality which I talk about is managing the different employees. So I anonymized everybody so that you don't know who every single employee is, but this would, these would be real names. So I just created a user, like these are all new users. I created a user, uh, but before I created users, I wanted to show you this department mapping that I spoke about. Say somebody works in DevOps or InfoSec, you can say these are all the groups that they should be automatically added to based on their department. So if you go into user management and you actually create the user, then they should be automatically added to these departments. So some of the stuff is automatically populated, so you click create. So if you go back to user management and look at groups, um, one of the groups that they should be automatically added to is Hacker1. So they are automatically added. So let me add one more user just to show what happens when the user gets deleted. So if you go back in, somebody gets offboarded, whatever it is, you need to delete that user. That's great. Just click on delete. It'll make sure you want to actually do that. And it'll delete the employee. So now if you go back and get the list of groups again, and you look at Hacker1 one, one more time, the person is gone. So there's only my user which I added earlier. So that's great. Onboarding, offboarding, super easy. You don't have to think about it too much. You don't have to uh, manually do a lot of this work. Other thing it can do is you can create API keys to access concierge through any client that you want. We ship a Python client that is pre-configured, does a whole bunch of things. Uh, you can get your own API key, API secret. You can also manage your own SSH key. So if you want SSH access to servers and you want to get added things, uh, you can get your own SSH key. You add it to the concierge there. Um, and next time somebody adds you via salt, it should automatically take this key, put it in your authorized keys file. It should just work like magic. The other thing we added is audit logs. You can see what every user did and what even the system did. So somebody got added to a department, to an Active Directory group via department mapping, it'll show you that. Somebody created an API key, it'll show you that. So the other thing I spoke about was access requests. So you saw our SaaS instances there, which was AMP production and AMP staging. What if I want to add a new service, like the SSH service? So all I had to do was import a new thing called SSH service. And I'm going to refresh um, the objects that Dorman knows about. I ran the wrong command, so I'm going to run it again with the right command. 
And that will get the new objects that all of these access services are aware about. So when you create a new access request, you now, once I refresh this, I guess, you should be able to see SSH service for Adapar servers. So if you click on that, you can then get a list of all the servers that you can request access to. I'm going to choose, uh, I had to reload Apache to make sure everything worked correctly, but uh, I'm going to choose salt um, .adapar.com, which is our salt stack for this set of servers. I'm going to give a bullshit reason because why not? I'm going to request access for one hour. So when I request access, it does two things. It sends me an email saying that my request has been submitted for approval and what I requested access to. And it sends my manager an email. In this case, uh, I am my own manager because demo. Um, so it sends me an email saying, please approve this. Then once I go there, I can either approve this request or reject it. I approve this request, and now I should be able to go in and SSH into salt.adapowerboom.com. And it should be magic, as it is. Cool. The other thing it does as soon as it grants access is it sends an email to the DevOps group saying, hey, this person got access to this. If you feel it's unnecessary, you should go in and revoke it. If they want to, they revoke with extreme prejudice. And if I try to SSH again, I can't do that anymore. So that's the demo. Um, there's a few things remaining before we can make concierge open source. And that is, if you saw the UI, I use Google Materialize. I'm not a designer. I don't really write UIs. So it looks like Skittles. It's not, it's not the best UI. But you know, it works. Um, there are very few tests. Uh, there's definitely tests, but they don't really cover 90% of the things. So we need more tests for the back end and front end. And once that's ready, we're going to open source concierge. And the logic for that is if we don't have tests, then we can't have people meaningfully contribute. They can't know whether something is broken, whether everything works, stuff like that. So one of the things we want to do before we open source is at least write tests for the basic functionality that we don't want to break. Important announcement, Adapar is hiring. You want to come work on concierge? We're hiring security engineers, DevOps engineers, IT ops folks. Talk to me, talk to anybody in the Adapar hoodie, talk to that tall redhead guy that's wearing the Adapar shirt. Um, we're happy to talk to you if you're looking for a new job, or if you're not looking, we'll convince you that this is the right move. Um, all right, that's concierge. Make access control great again. Mike. Absolutely. So the system does allow all, like, so if you're an admin or if you're a manager, it allows you to see all the requests that somebody made. So you can absolutely see all the different requests somebody made. I'm building functionality to approve them within the UI as well. What if I'm a total noob and I want to go and see what I can request for fun? Can I see everything? Yes. Okay. You can see everything. Okay. So you mentioned concierge pulls the data from the Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, so one of the questions was why not, so concierge pulls data from the HR system, why not push and um, have an event that reports it? So the main reason we don't push is, so the only thing we push today is maybe their email address, but we've had issues where um, for some reason their names change magically and we don't want to get into those inconsistencies. Marriage. So, hmm? exactly marriage and stuff like that. So that's why we don't do it today, but it's absolutely in the works. Like it's something we want to do. Right, so the question was, when you're offboarding, what if one of the APIs you're accessing is down? So. The way concierge deals with that is it looks at the, the salary exceptions are pushed and keep, it keeps track of it, and it retries it at a later time. So it does look at that. And the other thing you can do with concierge is you can, you can tell concierge what services to offboard them from, and it keeps track of that as well. And you can then go ahead and say, okay, this, they weren't offboarded correctly. Let me try this again. 
Other questions? Sure, absolutely. The question was, how do you, what QA process do you have before you had this fully take over everything? So, honestly speaking, our IT department couldn't wait for this. So, our QA process was simply try it out and let me know if it breaks. And that's how we tested it. Is um, so they, it was in place, and like when we launched it, there were a few bugs. I put myself. Uh, I, I, I put myself on page duty, they paged me when something went wrong, and yeah, like, our QA process was honestly our IT people looking at it and stuff like that. Why did you bring in Active Directory? Um, so one login, Okta didn't really play well with LDAP, like with OpenLDAP. Uh, when I spoke to them, they said that they only read from OpenLDAP, they don't quite write to OpenLDAP. And the only thing that really works correctly is AD. So that's that's why I had to bring an AD. Uh, yeah. Huh? Yeah. Oh yeah. We for the testing we actually had a second Google account that we set up a brand new Google Apps domain that we tested things on before we rolled it out to everybody. But that so we had an adapar.com domain on Google Apps. We set it set up at a parvum.com and we tested it on the second account, made sure everything worked before rolling it account. Secondary Google Apps domain and the whole deal. Yeah, I forgot about that, sorry. Yeah. Um, other questions? All right, thank you so much. Thanks very much, Kartik. From Fitbit, your Fitbit. Our sponsor. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll be up again at 4:10 with Jeff Mann on.